Hey, it's me. I'm going to do a weekend update. Uh, what I've read, what I'm going to read, mostly horror stuff, a few other things, give an update on my 100 book challenge, my read what you own challenge. I've got the, what have I got here? I've got the, the bingo card up for horror mayhem. Um, here's a photo of it. And I'll, I'll mark them off as they go. Um, why not? It's fun. I'm, I'm not going to get them all. I see a couple on there that I'm not even going to attempt. Graphic novel is one of them. I don't have a suggestion for a horror graphic novel. If you want to put one in the comments, one you really like that's not from Hell or Werewolf by Night or Tomb of Dracula, which are the only horror comics I can recall reading. I, I suppose graphic novels, so I guess a, a collection of creepy short stories or EC short stories wouldn't count. You know, I could fudge it, but I'm not in really a graphic novel mood. Although I did just finish a graphic novel, not horror related. Anyway, hope this is loud enough. I feel like it's not. Um, so first let me just go down the list of what I read for my 100 book challenge. That's where I read 100 books that I own before I buy any more except for the times I've cheated, which I feel bad about and I feel worse about every week. Now, I did buy a couple of writing-related books, but they're kind of for a project I'm working on, so I'm pretending those aren't for pleasure, but everything's for pleasure for me because I don't make any money doing anything. Um, but let's see. This Okay, so I left off last time I had read. Last time I gave an update, I had read 19 books on my challenge. Since then, I have read seven more. I'm at 26. Those are The Beetle by Richard Marsh, which I did a video on. When Darkness Loves Us by Elizabeth Engstrom, which, as I said in my video on, on Engstrom, is probably my favorite book I've read this year. I did a video that I put up yesterday for the most two recent Valancourt books I read, which was... The Pack by David Fisher and The Nest by Gregory A. Douglas. Those are animal horror uh, novels. So look back uh, on my channel for any of those. We're going to read about those. I also read a noir book. It's really not a novel. It's a novella. But I'm counting it as a novel because I'm counting, if something's an individual file, I'm counting it as a book. It's called Woman in the Dark by Dashiell Hammett from 1933. It was actually uh, published in the 80s or 90s or sometime as a standalone novel. Not Dashiell Hammett's best work. His his stuff is always worth reading, though. It's a, it's a little uh, harried and, and frantic and... Um, I'm constantly rereading Dashiell Hammett because I forget his stories sometimes. I forget which ones I I, I uh, like so much. I probably every couple of years I read Red Tide because I can't remember if I've read it. And uh, you know some are, are really stick in my mind, like of course the Maltese Falcon, the Thin Man, and the Dane Curse, but I, I love just dipping in and out of his shorter works because I just love his prose style and he really invented um, modern hard-boiled crime fiction along with other people, but you know what I mean. Okay, so that's basically everything. Oh, and I just finished, uh, well, I'm in the middle of the second one. I've just read, don't know if I'll, I might end up doing a video on these two books by Lisa Tuttle. I read Familiar Spirit, which is her, one of her earliest novels. Uh, might be her, her first standalone novel, um, which is also reissued in Paperbacks from Hell. Uh, really well-written haunted house novel from the 70s. Uh, 70s take on haunted houses. Uh, you know, it's again, was it the 70s or was it early 80s? Um, 1989 paperback, 1981, my goodness. Oh, 83. Okay, so uh, again, around that like sort of sweet spot of the, of the horror boom and when um, uh, 
uh, Clive Barker's uh, books were first released in the United States, I believe. Another another Will Erickson uh, introduction, um, and it was good. I read her first. I read her uh, story collection, Nest of Vipers. Is that what it's called? Last year, and I really liked it. You know, I I really this is. Uh, this horror challenge is reminding me that I really prefer uh, A Nest of Nightmares was her horror collection I read already. Um, reminding me that for horror, you know, you can't beat short fiction, in my opinion. There are some good horror novels, of course. I did like those animal ones I read, but I really think nothing compares to the best horror short fiction. You think about it, you know, Poe, what's he known for? Short fiction. Lovecraft, short fiction. MRGM short fiction, Lisa Tuttle, uh, and um, has a couple of different collections out. The um, that was the only novel I read by her, but she's. I'm now reading a second collection of hers that's out from Valancourt. This is before they started their paperbacks from hell uh, imprint, The Dead Hours of the Night. I read about. Mm, one, two, three, four, five. I've read the first five stories, about ten or so. This story, man, replacements. Read that. That is an intense short story. So after that, I had to stop reading for a while and, and, and take them in. You know, I don't I like to read. Uh, I, I don't like to really binge horror when I find a good one. I think I'm discovering this about myself, too, like that. Elizabeth Engstrom story, I would just want to take it in. Uh, the Re Replacements is such a cool story. She's a uh, great, great writer. She wrote, uh, um, I'm speaking about uh, Lisa Tuttle now. She's written many different kinds of things. I think she has a fantasy trilogy. She co-wrote a book, one of her earliest books was co-written with uh, George R. R. Martin. She's kind of from that circle. She's an Austin writer. That horror, that, um, Familiar Spirit, that haunted house novel uh, that I mentioned, takes place in Austin. Um, it was good. I don't have a lot to, to say about it. It's just I, I really recommend her short stories more. I think you could pick up either of these collections she's got out now if you're interested in really well-written literary horror. Dead Hours of the Night um, and whatever the other one was called. I forgot already. Anyway, so I did read a couple other things that don't count towards my 100 book challenge. Let's get to those. I read a book called, are these on there? Writing Secrets of the World's Most Prolific Authors. Let's see if I can find that cover. It's kind of an interesting book, even if you don't want to be a writer. It's actually, in fact, probably better if, you, if you're not interested in being a writer. Not interested in writing, um, just because it's basically a, a compendium of. It's written by Sean McLaughlin. It's a compendium of the, the most insanely uh, prolific writers of the 20th century. Not even the most famous ones that people talk about, like, where in the world is the cover? Um, not even the most famous ones like Dickens or, you know, all the Victorians. He kind of skipped over those and went to these ranks of the world's most prolific authors, these people who wrote like, like 500 books. Um, for example, there's a, a long thing on Frederick Faust, who is uh, Max Brand. Um, very interesting to read about these people and just their insane writing speed and different... Um, Barbara Cartland's in here, George Simeno. Probably, of all these people, uh, Isaac Asimov, John Creasy's still pretty well-known, Barbara Cartland's well-known. Probably, of these people, the person is the only one who's still considered a, a, well, I guess Asimov is a major writer, an important writer be uh, Simeno. Um, some of these people, you know, Enid Mary Blyton and Walter Brown Gibson, who who knows, but they would just pump out thousands of books. The Spanish uh, Bolsa Libro books. Uh, these these are tiny, tiny little books that are like this square. 
uh, usually westerns or gothic horror and stuff that that are published in in Spain and sold uh, used to be sold all over Latin America. It's some of the first things I bought when I was trying to learn Spanish for like a buck or something. They're just uh, they're so much fun. Um, I don't sounds like they're not being printed anymore. So I enjoyed reading that book because I like to read about like insane uh, work ethics and stuff and live vicariously through it and imagine what it would be like to write that much. So let's see what else I got here. I, okay, so this week coming forward, I'm going to be reading more horror. I didn't get to nearly... And I also read The Conjure Woman by Charles W. Chestnut, which was uh, kind of like folk tales, uh, early American folk tales by African American writer. Um, they were written, and that was a uh, uh, free. Uh, what can I think of it? Download from Gutenberg as well that I had for a while that I thought would be interesting to read. It was kind of hard to read because of the dialect and stuff, and. Um, but it was interesting. It's more like a historical artifact, I would think. Uh, although he's a very uh, well-respected writer, Charles Chestnut, who's got a, a volume in the Library of America. And so historically a significant uh, writer of African-American folk tales or like retellings of African-American folk tales. Um, I don't think I wrote that on my 100 book challenge. Oh, no, I forgot to put it on there. So I've actually read 27 books of the 100, and I'll be ready to be done with it because I miss buying books so much. I also read, this is thanks to Michael K. Vaughn and his wonderful Comic Book Wednesday series, um, which is responsible for me reading comic books when I'm supposed to be doing other important things like reading serious books, because we all know comic books are, are terrible for you. No, I'm kidding. Uh, no, I don't want to re review Hoopla, Hoopla, but I'm looking at Hoopla so I can open up the Commandi books. He did a video on Commandi, so now I have to remember to link to him, hopefully again. Hopefully I will remember. And, um, you know, it's it great. He does that Comic Book Wednesday series, Michael K. Vaughn does with a response video from Steve Donahue. Now I have to link to him too. Um, he doesn't care. So that's fine. Um, and it's so funny to watch them go back and forth. It's almost w worth it to read everything that they talk about just so I can... And you, you can predict. If, if you watch those channels and you watch those comic, those comic book things back and forth. You can predict who felt what about each of these books. Um, but I read them and I checked them out. It's 40 issues in the, in the two volumes. And pretty much after the first 10 issues or so, I was done reading the word balloons because it's... Jack Kirby, when he wrote when he did his, uh, when he started writing those DC books, they just they just make no sense to me. I re last year, sometime last recently, not that long ago, I read his run, uh, a collection of his run of Jimmy Olsen, and I didn't understand one thing that was going on in those stories. But his art is so great; it's just the action. It's really just an excuse to have the action. Who cares? Who cares what the plots are? I noticed in the last, the, there's in these two volumes with Commandi, The Last Boy on Earth, which is a, a Jack, which is a Planet of the Apes ripoff, because uh, they couldn't get the rights to Planet of the Apes. So they had this series with this guy, with this kid. He grows up in a bunker. His grandfather dies. This is all like in the first half page. And then he gets, so he goes out into the world, and the world's now run by different. Uh, not just apes, but tigers and leopards and lions and who else? And, and there's rat people and there's all kinds of people. And, you know, he keeps getting captured and escaping. And, you know, there's really, it's kind of unclear what he's doing, what his goal is. Um, so he just goes around getting into fights and stuff. Um, occasionally meets a female character, uh, very occasionally. 
I think like uh, twice, and one turns out to be an alien or something. But in the last six issues, or maybe it's even less of the run that is here, uh, a different writer took over. I think it was Jerry Conway. And right away you could tell the stories are getting better. And then Jack Kirby left uh, DC with issue 40, and there was another um, couple years of the comic, but those have not been collected, so, so I don't know what to say about them. Okay. So, um, I can't count it as horror, though. I really can't. Let me see if I can get to this. To this bingo card, which I showed you. Okay, so, next week, the prompt for the Horror Mayhem Week 2 prompt. Uh, oh, just to recap again, I failed on the Week 1 prompt because... I picked out a local horror book to read, but I, I didn't finish it because I couldn't get into it, so I decided to drop that prompt. But this coming week is a prompt called uh, Hollywood, or movies, or something like that, cinema, however you want to interpret it. So I am going to read a book called, uh, if I can find it, it's by Ray Garten. I think it's called Hollywood Sex and Violence or something like that. Um... Ray Garten. So I'm going to read that. I don't know if I can find it. I'm going to read Kim Newman's second Dracula book called, and these are possibles because who knows what I'll end up really reading. Kim Newman's second Dracula book called The Bloody Red Baron because I have that one. So I'm going to count that for Universal Monsters. Uh, I probably should just do one where I, where I, a uh, video where I click on all these, uh, where I film the screen so, so I can mark all this stuff off on the bingo card. It's really not that uh, interesting, I don't think, to listen to me abstractly talk about different squares on a bingo card. Uh, where's Ray Garden? Okay, let's see if I can do this really disgusting time. Really disgusting. Uh, I've got all these Ray Gartens. I don't know how far I'm going to get to them. He just passed away, poor guy. He wasn't that old. Just passed away, like, just at the end of last month. And I'm not familiar with his... Not that familiar with... I'm not at all familiar with his work. I got all these in, like, a package deal, I think, from the... Okay, this is the book. It's taking forever to open for some reason. It's called Sex and Violence in Hollywood. Sex and Violence in Hollywood. It is a novel, though. These are published by Open Road, I guess. Early Bird Books. Oh, Open Road, yeah. They do a lot of uh, um, e-book reissues of things. These are pretty good covers compared to what a lot of their... Oh, it's not going to really give me... This might even be a collection of stories. I don't know. Acknowledgements. I seem, it seems I get a lot of help from a lot of, of the same people every time I write a book. Okay. Part one, sex. And there's quotes from uh, two of the bank of Hitchcock. Uh, is this... Okay. Chapter 1, the hot Los Angeles sun came through the open window over the bed and fell on Adam Julian's sweat slick back as he pistoned on and in and out of Gwen Cardell. Oh, God, what am I in for? Okay, but there are horror novels, not porn novels, um, but and that at least tells me it's a novel, not a survey of horror um, movies. So I'll give that one a shot. I've got a couple other... Um, movie-related things there I might read. There's this book by Ann Biller, who's a film director. She directed The Love Witch. She wrote a novel called something about Bluebeard, um, which I own, Bluebeard's Castle. So I might count that for... Um, if I read it, I might count that for Hollywood, too, because since she's a filmmaker and this is her first novel... Published by Verso Press. That's, uh, what else am I going to do this week? Got a tag coming up on Tuesday. I was tagged again. Someone tagged me uh, yesterday. David Novak tagged me and I did a uh, tag. And I've got another one that someone tagged me right after that. 
coming up on Tuesday, so there'll be lots more fun content, and happy reading!